Pronto. Uhum. Certo? Está me ouvindo bem? Sim. Então, som ok, tudo ok. É, boa noite a todas e todos. Essa é mais uma edição do Café Multilingue do Nupel. É um projeto do Nupel e da UFBA, que tem sido um sucesso. Né? Tivemos transmissões em várias línguas, vários idiomas, com a participação de muita gente, bem legal. E hoje a transmissão será em inglês. Mas a gente pode misturar um pouquinho de vez em quando. Temos uma convidada especial, minha querida amiga, professora lá do Instituto, uma pessoa de quem eu gosto muito. Professora Fernanda Mota. É, professora Fernanda Mota. Acho que a gente pode falar inglês já, né? Uh, professor Fernanda Mota, she is my good friend and her presence here is very special. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, she has written books. One of them is this one. Uh, Literatura Anglófona em Perspectiva. And the other one I'm going to share, I have a digital copy, so I'm going to share the, the cover. This one. Uh, Educação e Literatura, Reflexões sobre Questões Sociais, Raciais e de Gênero. It's a bilingual book, so you can read it in Portuguese and in English, right? The, the title in English is Education and Literature, Reflections on Social, Racial and Gender Matters. So it's a very interesting book. You can read it and you can learn English while reading it. Okay? So it's very interesting. Uh, today, Fern Fernanda will talk about de decolonizing English language learning uh, through literature and other media. So it's a very interesting topic. Uh, this uh, transmission is made especially to Nupel students, but it's open, it's public but it's made specially for you, Nupel students, because of the pandemic, we are not having classes. So uh, through this project, we hope uh, to get it, to keep in touch, right? And keep in touch with the language, which is more important. So uh, this is it. I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna read your questions. Uh, please ask questions. And now, Fernanda, please, the transmission is yours. Hi everyone, it's a great pleasure to be here with you tonight uh, to share some, some thoughts, some studies, reflections, experiences. I'd like to thank Nupel, especially professors Luciele, Savio and Daniel for the kind invitation. Uh, and it's, it's a great honor to be here and to share with you some, some insights on how we can decolonize English language learning through literature and other media. So as I know that some, some people that may be attending this, this, this talk uh, may not be uh, proficient in the language, I'll try to uh, conduct this presentation on a translingual basis. That means I'll speak some Portuguese sometimes, okay? So the idea is to try to make my points as crystal clear as possible. And that's why I'll try to, to speak slowly and clearly, okay? So, uh, então, eu vou tentar conduzir essa apresentação de uma forma translingue. Eu vou falar também um pouco em português, ok? But then, before I start, I'd like to say that I'd be more than pleased to have some interaction with you. Então, fiquem à vontade para interagir no, 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 no chat. So, while I ask some questions, I'd appreciate if you could answer them by jotting down some words on the chat. If there is no time to read them now on this live, I'll do it as soon as this live, not live, ends, okay? As soon as this live ends. Um, so, some keywords uh, are important to understand this live, okay? Então, algumas palavras-chave são bem importantes para entender essa live. Essas palavras são, these words are colonialism, coloniality, to decolonize, to um, hierarchize, global north, global south, stereotypes, borderland, borderland is frontera, okay? Let me quote the author. Single stories, mental slavery, slavery, escravidão, escravização, mental slavery, and freedom, freedom, liberdade. 
So the purpose of this talk revolves around two main questions. So there are two main questions that were points of departure for this uh, presentation. Então, duas questões são pontos de partida para a apresentação. How do colonized paradigms affect the way we learn languages? Uh, how can we decolonize English language learning through literature and other media? Então, um, como os paradigmas colonizados afetam a forma como nós aprendemos línguas e como nós podemos decolonizar a, o, o processo de aprendizagem de língua inglesa através da literatura e, outra, e outras mídias? But then, of course, two other questions are more important in times of pandemic and no face-to-face -face classes. Um, these questions are, what have you been doing to stay alive? O que é que vocês têm feito? Têm feito para ficar em vivos? What have you done so far to keep your interest in foreign languages alive? O que é que vocês têm feito até então para manter o interesse em línguas estrangeiras vivo? Well, I can say for myself, and then you can answer on, on our chat. I can say for myself that learning languages is one of the things that have helped me keep alive. And then when, I'm, when I say that, I am paraphrasing Un Vestido y Un Amor, by, that's sung by Caetano Veloso. I don't know if you have, uh, have ever listened to the song, but one of the lines is, Hay cosas que te ayudan a vivir. There are things that help you to live. Há coisas que te ajudam a viver. What are the things that help you live, that give liveliness to your life? What are the things that cross your mind when you think about happiness? Are the things colonized? What I'm saying may sound too philosophical and not related to languages. O que eu estou falando pode, pode, ficar, pode soar muito filosófico e não muito relacionado às línguas. But in the end, it's all about language. Our language choices have much to say about ideology and the cultural images that shape the way we conceive of life, happiness, fulfillment, health, and so forth. Então, quando nós falamos sobre vida, felicidade, o sentimento de, de satisfação, a, a saúde, etc., as nossas escolhas linguísticas têm muito, dizem muito sobre, sobre tudo isso. And about ideology, too. If you study English, the ideological, the ideological tones are even more evident. Because we can't forget the imperialist colors of this language, despite the fact that we are compelled by textbook to imagine that this language has only one color. Então, apesar dos livros didáticos nos levarem a pensar que essa língua tem apenas uma cor, nós sabemos que ela é uma língua de diversas cores. E ao falar em diversas cores, eu estou usando uma metáfora. And then, uh, Daniel uh, uh, wrote... Uh, a master's thesis about imperialism in the English language. So here's a very uh, insightful and important reference. The single color that paints our images about language demonstrates that we have never stopped being colonized. Nós nunca deixamos de ser colonizados. Within this reflection, I start my talk, but not before the warm up for the session. And then, of course, as an English teacher, we always have a warm-up for the beginning of our classes. Um, I'd like you to listen to the beginning of the song and tell me your feelings about it. Let's listen to it. I know that we, we would spend the night listening to Bob Marley. I just, I just wanted to activate your memory of this remarkable song, Redemption Song. And I'd like to quote two lines from it. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. When se emancipem dessa escravização mental. Ninguém mais nós mesmos podemos libertar nossas mentes. So have you ever listened to Bob Marley's redemption song? What does this redemption
attention refer to? What is this mental slavery? How enslaves our mind? And what enslaves it? Então, o que seria essa escravização mental? Quão escravizadas as nossas, é, é, está a nossa mente? E o que que a escraviza? So while we may think that it is, it is the capitalist system, sexism, or racism that enslave our minds, a Peruvian thinker, Aníbal Quijano, would say that colonialism is the very source of prejudice and the source of capitalism, sexism, and racism. Colonialism was the mechanism that bridged the principles of coloniality. And coloniality is a system of concepts that hierarchize people, the relationship between people and other beings, nature and culture, places, things, modes of existing and knowledge, and set them as either inferior or superior, worth living or not. And I assume that you have already been introduced to the concept of necropolitics, the politics of death that orchestrates actions that decide who can be the target of stray bullets. Bem, então, uh, quando nós pensamos sobre esses mecanismos que nos, nos escravizam, a gente pode acionar as palavras de Quirano, Aníbal Quirano, quando ele fala sobre a, a, a fonte, a, a matriz do, desse, do sistema capitalista, do, do sexismo, do racismo, que seria, então, o colonialismo. E, é claro, no bojo do colonialismo, a colonialidade, que é um sistema de conceitos que hierarquizam pessoas, a relação entre pessoas e outros seres, a natureza e a cultura, lugares, pessoas, formas de existir, conhecimento, e, e as categoriza como superiores ou inferiores, e que são dignas de, ser, de estarem vivas ou não. E, aí, então, com isso eu aciono o conceito de necropolítica, que é uma política da, de morte que orquestrações que, então, definem quem pode ser o alvo de balas perdidas. The social phenomena that derive from this hierarchization are accomplished by language. We can evoke some evidence of the role of language in shaping our assumptions through questions that I would like you to answer honestly. Então, vamos pensar aqui algumas perguntas para a gente pensar sobre essa hierarquização, essa categorização. How would your English teachers react to Bob Marley's English? When you study lessons about countries and nationalities, what countries are mentioned? When you learn about professions, what professions are taught? And when there is a conversation about traveling, what places are listed? When you think about traveling, what is the most desired destination? So in 20 years teaching English, London and New York figure as the, the main destinations when I ask this question. When you think about pronunciation, is it related to actually accent? How often do you watch YouTube ads uh, on how you can sound more like a native speaker when you study a target language? Então, uh, nós podemos pensar sobre a forma como a língua molda uh, as nossas as nossas crenças, através de algumas perguntas, que ainda gostaria que vocês respondessem. Uma delas é, é como as professores de inglês, vocês reagiriam ao inglês de Bob Marley? Quando vocês estudam é, lições sobre é, países e nacionalidades, quais são os países mencionados? Quando vocês estudam sobre profissões, quais são as profissões, as profissões é, ensinadas? E quando há uma conversação sobre viagens, sobre viajar, Quais são os, os, os países, os lugares que são listados? Quando vocês pensam em viajar, quais são os destinos mais desejados? E aí, então, eu sempre ouvi, né, nesses anos todos que eu ensino inglês, as palavras London and New York. London and New York. Quando você pensa em pronúncia, é pronúncia mesmo ah, que orbita né, entre as, as preocupações dos, dos alunos ou seria o sotaque? Quando, por que frequência vocês assistem a vídeos, no, a, a, anúncios no YouTube, a, em que, que anunciam que você pode estudar em inglês e então falar como, como nativo? All these questions boil down to coloniality. We have tailored our ideals of living based on Eurocentric or, more generally, global north paradigms. 
a gente sempre tem tela a colonialidade, principalmente os paradigmas do norte global. By doing so, we ignore or downplay paradigms other than the hegemonic ones. We tend to downplay paradigms which are not the hegemonic ones. A gente tende a minimizar os paradigmas que não são aqueles hegemônicos. By sticking to hegemony, we project ourselves to the image and sound of the native speaker. Uh, regardless of the fact that we are not foreign language, that, that we are foreign language speakers. We'll never be native speakers of the language. This language is our language too, but we we'll always belong to a hybrid, borderland situation, what Gloria Anzaldúa would call fronteira. E aqui então eu volto o conceito de fronteira, borderland, by Gloria, uh, de Gloria Anzaldúa, Anzaldúa, em que ela fala sobre essa condição híbrida, que é a condição do falante de língua estrangeira. We can be white conscious of phonetics and phonology and learn the shades of the consonant S. We, can, we know that we can pronounce this. S, Z, is depending on the phonological context. But at some point, after having an exhausting day or being, being angry, hungry, or sad, we always slide to what is more comfortable. We may forget this rule and just say this when it should be is and so forth. On account of this idea of native speaker, the very discussion that has already been widely held on native speakers in language learning, in language learning discussions um, raises the assumption that the ideal native speaker is that of the global north. And I would say the north of the north that intersects with some categories, the white and educated person. Então, quando a gente pensa nesse ideal do falante nativo, não é só é, aquele que está no norte global, mas é o norte do norte. E é, então a interseccionalidade com a questão racial e também, é claro, de classe social. Com a questão racial e de classe social. This ideal, this ideal of native speaker parallels with the overemphasis on standard English that has made us Brazilians become very judgmental about who can speak English and who speaks this language well or who can be eligible to achieve an advanced level. We should confess that sometimes the level of mimicry of hegemonic native-like variation is one of the main criteria we follow to qualify someone as an advanced speaker. This reflects hugely on our self-esteem and makes us shy away from interactions in the target language because we think we'll be the target of negative judgment and we can't speak well enough when what is enough is to be able to set our message across. So what I say here, um, nós temos geralmente esse ideal do falante. Esse ideal está em paralelo com a ênfase que nós damos ao inglês padrão e que tem feito, tem, tem feito com que nós brasileiros é, nos tornemos muito uh, cri críticos em relação a quem pode falar inglês, é, quem fala inglês bem ou quem está elegível para ser ser classificado como um falante de, de nível avançado. É, e muitas vezes nós classificamos essa pessoa como falante de nível avançado dependendo da forma como ele imita essa forma, é, essa variação mais ligada ao eixo hegemônico, onde o inglês é falado. E é claro que isso traz grandes impactos à nossa autoestima. E é por isso que muitas pessoas, apesar de falar inglês, evitam falar porque elas, elas se sentem intimidadas e pensam que vão ser, que ao falar a língua-alvo, língua elas serão alvo de, um, é, de críticas negativas. Uh, quando, na verdade, falar bem é conseguir transmitir uma mensagem, é conseguir se comunicar. We can decolonize our principles and enhance our learning process. But how? How can we decolonize our learning process and question our assumptions? The first step is to turn left, go down, swirl our minds, look around, and delve into oceans other than the ones we are often compelled to follow. That means reading books, 
watching movies and TV shows, and listen to music produced in several countries, in manifold countries. When we displace ourselves from our comfort zone and the zones that have been set as such, as, as comfort zones, or as the ideal place, we give ourselves the chance to have manifold experiences that display different differences and aspects of our own identity. I had never related so much to a character, for example, in her school life, than with Kimberly, the protagonist of Purple, Purple Hibiscus by the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Madadichi, and now the character Martina, the protagonist of, of the novel Inner City Girl by the Jamaican writer Colleen smith Dennis. By reading these this books, I also decolonize my sense, coined by the textbooks I use to study or teach, that English is spoken in a monolingual context and that it is a variety neutral language. In Purple Hibiscus, for example, we read Igbo words and see how multilingual and multicultural Nigeria is. In Inner City Girl, we see the, the use of those words that our teachers usually correct in the classroom when they say these and they say it's this. And then when you read the novel, you see that this is written as these with a D, right? And several sentences without a pronoun like am tired instead of I am tired or I being, being pronounced as ah, I like you instead of I like you. So, uh, então nós podemos decolonizar os nossos é, princípios e é, melhorar e, e enhance our learning process uh, através um, e é claro questionar alguns dos nossos das nossas crenças é, e uma dessas uma dessas formas é esse descentramento é, é mergulhar em oceanos que são oceanos outros, né? e não aqueles que são normalmente, nós somos geralmente guiados a seguir. Isso significa ler livros, assistir a filmes, a, a programas de TV, ouvir música que, que são produzidos em outros países. Quando nós passamos por esse processo de assentamento, é, de autodescentramento, da nossa, e nos distanciamos de uma zona de conforto, ou daquelas zonas que são legitimadas como conforto, ou como lugares ideais, nós nos damos a oportunidade de vivenciar diferentes experiências que uh, dizem muito sobre diferenças, mas também revelam aspectos da nossa identidade. E então eu mencionei dois exemplos de dois romances, um é, é o Ibisco Roxo, o Papa Hibiscus, de Timamanda Ditchi, uma autora nigeriana, e Inner City Girl, de uma autora jamaicana, Colin smith Dennis. E eu realmente me identifiquei muito com as personagens. A história que elas contam é sobre a vida delas na escola. E aí, então, é claro que esses romances também revelam o contexto é, multilingue, que não se, não, se, não se restringe àquele contexto monolingual, que é normalmente monolingue, que é apresentado pelos livros didáticos. Quando a gente estuda inglês, fica parecendo que a língua inglesa é a única língua falada nos dos países que a gente vem a visitar, o que seus falantes só falam inglês. E então, a gente vê como há vários contextos que, que têm esse fenômeno do, do, do multilinguismo. Um, e também pude ver alguns aspectos fonéticos e também lexicais que são comumente corrigidos nas aulas de inglês e que, então, são é, variedades faladas em outros países. A exemplo do, do, da pronúncia né, do, do TH, famosa pronúncia do TH, this, que é, então, no romance é, é grafado como this, this, com D mesmo. So, does valuing or knowing these varieties mean that, from now on, we should forget about standard English and learn Jamaican, Trinidadian, Barbadian, Singaporean English? Né? Então, isso significa que a gente tem que esquecer o inglês padrão e pensar apenas, e aprender o inglês jamaicano, de Trinidad, de Barbados, de Singapura, no, it doesn't, or yes, it does. It depends on your choice. But in the end, regardless of this choice, we'll always be in context 
in which we have to negotiate meaning when we speak. And we've always been in situations crisscrossed by different varieties of the language. So as Chinua Chebi would say, whether for some people language is a matter of either or, for him and for me, it is a matter of both. But he's also the one who claims that we have to try to find a balance of stories. And that means uh, prioritizing the stories, language varieties, cultures that have been overshadowed by imperialist ones. Então, quando a gente pergunta se a gente tem que deixar de lado né, o inglês padrão e pensar apenas no inglês, estudar o inglês jamaicano, de Trinidad, Barbados, de Singapura, a resposta é não, sim. E tudo vai depender, na verdade, da escolha de vocês. Mas, no final, independentemente dessa escolha, é, nós sempre estaremos em contextos em que vai ser necessário negociar significado. Então, é, é, como o a Chebe diz, pra, se para algumas pessoas, quando a gente fala sobre língua, é uma questão de ou, ou, ou uma coisa ou outra, para ele, para mim também, é uma questão de ambos. Mas o Tinua Chebe também, eu concordo com ele, diz que nós temos que tentar encontrar um equilíbrio de histórias. Isso significa priorizar histórias, é, variedades da língua, culturas que foram, de certo modo, deixadas em segundo plano pela, pelos, pelos países imperialistas. What we should pursue is to free ourselves from mental slavery. And this means to free ourselves from assumptions that make us judgmental, thus perpetrating oppressive systems that are accomplished by language and silenced voices and affect the self-esteem. These oppressive systems label people according to several criteria that are aligned with single stories. For Chimamanda Dichi, a single story is a stereotype, a simplified way of encapsulating the plurality, plur, plur, plurality it's a tricky word, plurality of things, people and places that we are unable to recognize because of years of domestication of our perception. So I say that again. For Chimamanda Dichi, a single story is a stereotype. We can, we can, um, equate this, like think about single stories as stereotypes, which are simplified ways of encapsulating the plurality of things, people and places that we are unable to recognize because of years of domestication of our perception. And so we label people according to this grammar mirror that reflects things according to our rules. Então, o que nós deveríamos buscar é libertar, nos libertar desse processo de escravização mental. Isso significa nos desvencilhar de, de crenças que nos tornam tão é, críticos, com juízos fortes de, de, juízo, com juízo, um forte juízo de valor. E, e com isso, nós acabamos de perpetuar sistemas de opressão, que então são colocados em prática através da língua e que silenciam vozes e que afetam, obviamente, a autoestima. Ah, esses sistemas de opressão rotulam as pessoas de acordo com diferentes critérios. E esses critérios estão alinhados com histórias únicas. Acho que vocês já devem ter assistido The Danger of the Single Story. Para a Amanda Ditti, a história única é um estereótipo. E aí eu defino como uma, uma forma simplificada de encapsular a pluralidade das coisas, pessoas e lugares que nós não conseguimos reco reconhecer por causa dos anos de domesticação da nossa percepção. E então nós rotulamos as pessoas de acordo com essa, o que eu chamei de grammar mirror, um espelho de gramática, que reflete as coisas de acordo com as nossas regras. To illustrate, when I started, and I'm going, now I'm going to share a personal experience. To illustrate, when I started to teach in higher education, the first question a secretary at the institution where I taught asked me was not my name, but whether I had lived abroad. After saying no, she raised questions on whether I was really pursuing a master's degree and asked the coordinator to check that. Of course, this preconception about me was based on the assumption that uh, what qualifies someone to be an English teacher, a professor, and English speakers to is to live abroad, to having had this experience of living abroad. That was probably also 
um, that this preconception was probably based on assumptions related to her interpretation of other signs that made her think I wouldn't be eligible to teach English in higher education. Then you may think about the reasons. Então, um, eu falei sobre um relato, trouxe um relato pessoal quando comecei a dar aula na, na instituição de ensino superior. A primeira pergunta que a, que a secretária que trabalhava lá, lá fez não foi o meu nome, mas você já tinha morado no exterior. E aí, então, é claro que e aí, ela começou a levantar dúvidas sobre se eu realmente era, estava fazendo mestrado ou não. E pediu para a coordenação para que checasse isso. É, é claro que esse, esse, essa pré-concepção, esse pré-conceito que ela teve sobre mim foi baseado nessa, nessa crença de que para ser um professor de inglês ou, e dar aula na instituição, instituição de ensino superior, se eu falar de competente da língua, é necessário ter morado no exterior. É, e é claro também alguns outros signos que ela interpretou em relação a mim, a minha aparência, que a levou a pensar que eu não estaria elegível para aquela função. This episode illustrates how we tend to create single stories and follow them faithfully. Então esse episódio ilustra como nós tendemos a criar single stories, histórias únicas e segui-las realmente. We imagine the kind of perfect teacher as the one who spent years abroad and sounds like the Netflix actors in US or British TV shows. Someone with a foreign name and other stereotypes. Como assim que a gente imagina, né? Assim, tem esse imaginário sobre o professor de inglês, né? Muitas pessoas ainda têm. E aquela pessoa que passou anos fora, fala inglês, né? Que soa como aqueles atores do Netflix nos programas de TV é, estadunidenses e britânicos. This is a colonized view that we can deconstruct when we travel to other countries and see that the, the McDonaldized English we learn in textbooks and some TV shows is just one of the options on the table. In the sense, the richness we live that lies in having, having lived abroad equates with the richness we find in, in visiting many places. And when I say visiting many places, it means when you visit, when you travel to these places, but also when you, we read the literature and other um, media produced in these places. Então, um, quando a gente imagina, a gente tem essa, essa ideia porque nós temos uma visão colonizada, que nós podemos des, desconstruir é, quando nós viajamos para outros, outros países. Né? Então, nós podemos perceber que esse inglês McDonaldizado, nós aprendemos através dos livros didáticos e também em alguns programas de TV, uh, são, é apenas uma das opções que nós temos. Uh, outros ingleses também, outras línguas inglesas. Então, essa riqueza que nós, que algumas pessoas acreditam encontrar em ter, em, em ter tido essa experiência de morar, morar fora, acaba se equiparando à riqueza que nós encontramos em visitar muitos países onde essa, essa língua é falada. E essa visita pode ser uma visita física, né, ir para esses lugares, mas também pode, ser, pode, pode ocorrer através da literatura e de outras, outras mídias. Because for some years I educated my ears to such textbooks and media, so my listening was somehow tailored by these textbooks and, media, and this, this kind of media, Uh, it was not easy for me to understand people when I traveled to Singapore, South Africa, when I listened to Maori people mixing English and Maori in New Zealand, and Trinidad Trinidadians speaking Trini English. Of course, in order to access the, the linguistic richness of these places, we don't need to travel abroad. I did that because I had to face my own fears of traveling abroad. And you wanted to be a teacher with a repertoire of stories that, that would not be tailored by experiences that stem from a focus on the inner circle country. In the States. And by the way, I haven't visited these countries yet. So, but it wasn't easy for me to understand the English spoken in Singapore, South Africa, New Zealand, because I learned English. Uh, thinking that it was, a, uh, it was spoken in monolingual context. So there wouldn't be other languages being spoken. And I also learned that kind of uh, through those recordings, those mechanical recordings 
and also by watching movies and watching TV shows, you need to see that the standard, the standard English uh, prevails. Então, quando eu viajei para Singapura, África do Sul, é, fui para Nova Zelândia, eu vi os Maoris falando, misturando inglês, a, a língua Maori, os, o, o inglês em Trinidad e Tobago, é, nem, não era fácil, tão fácil entender. Porque é claro que eu tive uma formação, acho que quase todo mundo, sobretudo as pessoas da década de 80, como eu, tiveram a formação, década de 80, 90, em que a gente só tinha acesso àquele inglês falado no Inner Circle, né? Falado nos Estados Unidos ou Inglaterra. Talking about these experiences is an invitation to decolonize language learning. Então, falar sobre isso é um convite a decolonizar uh, uh, o aprendizado de língua. This can be accomplished through aesthetic experiences in the arts and other media. When we study foreign languages through music, literature, to shows, we expand vocabulary, improve the receptive skills, listening and reading, and that reflects on the productive skills, speaking and writing. And we develop not only linguistic and communicative competence, but also intercultural competence. Então, quando a gente tem acesso a essas diferentes, a, a música, a literatura, programas de TV, uh, que é falado né, em diversos outros países, a gente expande. Né? Nós, me, a, o nosso vocabulário, aprimoramos a, os, os, as nossas habilidades de recepção, compreensão oral, leitura, e isso se reflete também nas habilidades de produção a fala e a escrita. E aí, então a gente consegue desenvolver não apenas a competência linguística é, e comunicativa, mas também a competência intercultural. But then, what books can I recommend? And then I, I, I can say that um, I learned a lot through literature. A lot. Uh, I've always been a reader. I love to read. And... Um, And I learned a lot. I learned lots of words. And I also learned about the culture and life stories through literary texts. But then, of course, the TV shows have helped a lot, too. I keep on studying English and I study other languages, too, like Spanish, for example, uh, French, German, and now uh, some other languages like Guarani, too. I started to study Arabic and some others. So I'm very curious about languages. And then what books can I recommend? So thinking about Menupel students who are now uh, without classes, face-to-face -face classes. So what you can do to learn the language? O que vocês podem fazer para aprender a língua durante esse período que vocês não estão tendo aula presencial, esse período de quarentena? So I don't discard Harry Potter, okay? Não discard Harry Potter. Tem gente que adora ótimo de ler um dos livros. Uh, claro, there is room for Harry Potter. Há espaço para o Harry Potter. But you can also read, and then, thinking about the balance of stories that Chinua Chabi mentions, and also Chimamanda Vichy, the balance of stories, esse equilíbrio de stories. Haven't we had access, you know, too often, I'd say, to um, European literature, US literature? So now it's time for the African, African countries. Um, so, and then what I recommend, I recommend this book, Baking Cakes in Kigali by Gaby Parkin. This book features, it is for the uh, intermediate and advanced students. It features a Tanzanian character who lives in Rwanda, a country that is marked by multilingualism. Uh, the novel brings examples of, and then we can see this multilingualism. So there is Kinua, Rwanda, Rwanda, sorry, Kinua, Rwanda, French, Swahili, uh, there are these words, uh, words in this language, and the book is written in English. So we can learn, um, we can read the story of a very fascinating character, Angel, she makes cakes, and while she makes cakes, um, she talks to her clients, and uh, uh, they, they share with her lots of stories that uncover cultural aspects of uh, the culture in, in Rwanda. Not only in Rwanda, in Tanzania too. There are characters from Tanzania besides uh, Angel. Um, I also recommend the, the Way of Writer by the Maori writer uh, Ihimaera. 
I had this, I forgot to, to put it here on the table, but yeah, it's a very interesting uh, novel, The Way a Writer, uh, that presents the Maori culture, how people have access to uh, education and their principles, their connection to nature. It's a very interesting novel. Um, and there are many others that I could I could give as an example, like Perfect High Business to and so forth. So um, these books are great reading practice if you are an advanced and intermediate uh, or, or an intermediate reader. And then if you ask whether students of basic levels could also use literature, the answer is yes, yes, they can. Ruby Carr's poems um, are readable for basic students. And I'd say that short stories that Chimamanda Adichie can be introduced to the students. Plays like A Raisin in the Sun is another example. So it's possible for those students when they are guided by a professor or even if they want to, um, to try to read by identifying some uh, cognates or words they already know and then try to be more familiar with the text by challenging themselves and using translations. It's okay to use Google Translate. I don't know what would be, what, what would happen to me in um, what my life would be like in my Arabic studies if I didn't have Google Translate. So it's really important. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice tool. It's a good tool. It's not okay to translate everything all the time, but it's a very nice tool. Um, there are movies that also showcase African culture, um, a culture that we should learn more about. That, that, that's something I defend, right? African culture. And I'd say that New Zealand is also a place that uh, I think that we st should study more, as well as the Solomon Islands, okay? So, um, and then there are some movies, and we can use these movies to learn more about culture and study the language too. So some examples of movies are Cook Off, it's it was translated as A Cozinha Incrível de Janesso, está na Netflix. Um, and the first grader, O Aluno, right? It's, it features the story of uh, Nganga, a Kenyan, uh, a Kenyan person. He, he really uh, existed, right? So it's uh, based on a real story. Uh, he's, a he's an 84-year-old man who decides to start learning how to, how to read when he goes to school. It's a fascinating story. So in music, but these are just some examples, but there are many uh, Nollywood movies on Netflix. Okay? It's, it's nice to, to watch Nollywood productions. I really, I really like them. I really enjoy them to have access to different mindsets, different ways of filming to... Uh, different performances of actors, it's a, nice, it's, it's a very good option. In, mu in music, we can listen to Jamaican, Nigerian, Trinidadian music. And then let me give uh, an example of Calypso Rose. So I'm going to show an example. I'm, I would say, I'd say I'm going to get you to listen to an example because it's Friday, because music's nice, so. So this is Leave Me Alone by Calypso Rose. Well, I, I had to stop, otherwise I'd be to carry it away, right? It's Friday night. But then we can learn a lot about uh, culture by listening to music, to Calypso songs. Um, and so I think that these are, this is a way of, music's also a way of have, having access to culture and learn the language while enjoying, right? Ourselves, you know, in, in, while having some fun. Um, então, Quais são os livros que eu recomendo, os materiais né, que eu recomendo? Eu falei sobre Baking Cakes em Kigali, que se passa em, em Ruanda, e tem uma personagem principal que um, vende bolos, e quando ela, as pessoas fazem um bolo com ela, 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 elas contam suas histórias, eles encomendam os bolos e ela uh, conta as histórias. A gente tem acesso a um contexto multilingüe nesse, nesse país, porque há exemplos de palavras em 
Kim Wa Rwanda em francês, em Swahili, né? e, a, e, a, e o romance escrito em inglês. Também falei sobre Way Rider, que é de um autor é, maori, né, da Nova Zelândia. É, mencionei também, falei que, claro, esses livros eles podem ser usados, podem ser lidos por alunos de nível intermediário, avançado, mas é, se vocês perguntarem se os alunos de nível básico também poderiam ler né, é, literatura para poder, então, aprender a língua, eu mencionei os, po os poemas de, de Rupp Kaur, é, e também algumas, alguns contos de Mamanda Ditchie, e uma, uma peça, Raising in the Sun. Bem, esses são só alguns exemplos, é, mas é claro que também tem os filmes, que a gente pode aprender inglês enquanto a gente está se divertindo. E alguns desses filmes são A Cozinha Incrível de Anderson, né, que em inglês é Cook Off, um, The First Grader, O Aluno, então, esses são só alguns exemplos, mas tem vários filmes de, uh, de Nollywood. Eles são disponíveis, inclusive, na Netflix. Em termos de música, a gente tem a música jamaicana, nigeriana, a música de Trinidad e Tobago, que é a minha última viagem, então estou ainda bem é, excited about Trinidad e Tobago. Então, aí, então eu mencionei essa é, a Calypso Rose né, e a música é, Leave Me Alone. Dei aqui um exemplo para vocês. So, What these texts, movies, songs can do for learning is to expand this experience and transcend language for language sake's purposes. Então, o que, é que esses textos, esses filmes e músicas podem fazer pra, pelo, pelo processo de aprendizagem? Eles podem expandir essa experiência e fazer com que ela transcenda o, a língua pela língua. Né? Esse estudo da língua, esse propósito de aprender a língua pela língua. Né? Apenas como, como sistema. Se considerando essa riqueza cultural que atravessa. We learn languages to access knowledge, or what Catherine Walsh would call knowledges. We know that knowledge is an accountable noun, but when she says, when she uses knowledges, she wants to refer to the difference between knowledge, conhecimento, and knowledges, saberes. Uh, so we have access to knowledges when um, we watch movies, we listen to songs, we read literature. We have to value this plurality. <laughs> I should have I should have rehearsed before. Plurality, knowledges and diverse modes of living. So we have to to value this, and and we should also value the diverse types of existence, including human beings and other beings, that's trying to live in harmony with with the earth, as the poetics of the being vivir implies. So I don't know if I have. A I've ever heard of the bien vivir, o bom viver. Uh, so we learn these principles when we have access to, to knowledges from the global south. So read, watch, seize global south productions, study indigenous culture. Então, uh, nós temos que, que valorizar essa pluralidade, esses saberes, diversos modos de existir, Diversos tipos de, de, de vidas, de existências, incluindo as vidas humanas e as não humanas, tentando viver em harmonia com a Terra, como a poética do, do, do bem viver é, sugere. Sugere, né? Eu diria que defende. Ah, e nós aprendemos esses princípios quando nós temos acesso a saberes, do, principalmente saberes do sul global. Então, leiam, assistam, aproveitem essas, essas produções desse sul global e é, estudem uma, a cultura indígena. So, when I traveled to New Zealand, that was one of my purposes. I spent my birthday, best birthday, birthday ever, with the Maoris last year. I wanted to learn about their philosophy of life, and by doing that, when I returned, The first thing I did was to enroll in a Guarani course that was conducted by professor, the great professor Ivana Ivo. Because I saw from the examples in, in New Zealand how the Kiwi people, the white people there, value Maori language, the Maori language, the Maori co culture, and how the Maori take pride, the Maori people take pride in speaking Maori and English, and especially Maori. So I wanted to follow the example. The lessons we, oh, sorry. And then, quando eu viajei para Nova Zelândia, um dos meus, uh, dos meus propósitos é, era 
ter acesso à cultura, à cultura indígena, à cultura nativa. Então, eu passei meu aniversário com os Maoris, e, em Rotorua, e eu queria aprender mais sobre a filosofia de vida deles, e ao fazer isso, quando eu retornei, a primeira coisa que eu fiz foi me matricular num curso de Guarani, que foi, foi conduzido, foi ministrado pela professora Ivana Ivo. E aí, então, eu vi o exemplo dos, dos kiwis, que é como a gente chama a população branca de, da Nova Zelândia, como eles valorizam a, a língua maori. E como os maoris também, é, algumas pessoas falam maoris, é, se orgulham de falar maori e, e inglês. E eu diria até que um pouco mais o, o próprio maori. Então, eu queria seguir esse exemplo, eu queria aprender uma língua indígena. So, the lessons we learn when we read books, listen to stories, watch movies and TV shows, or when we travel, are part of the stories of our lives. They can enrich our sense of diversity. But there are stories that make us perpetrate colonialism, which aim to downsize the, the world, to simplify categories hierarchic, hierarchically displayed. An example is Heart of Darkness, a novel by Joseph Conrad. To avoid this, to avoid this kind of, of, of literary texts, of productions that perpetrate colonialism, my advice is to add as many colors as possible to the landscape of your, of your cultural and linguistic education. Study languages. Even if your focus now is on English, Study Spanish too. Learn some Guarani, Yoruba, Kimbundo. Allow yourself to travel through languages. And if wings, the wings are literature and other media, produced by writers aligned with decoloniality, then I will know that you are not only expanding vocabulary, you are also expanding your horizon. And maybe that is the most enriching path towards our freedom. Então, as lições que nós aprendemos quando nós lemos livros, ouvimos histórias, assistimos é, a, fi a filmes ou programas de TV, ou quando nós viajamos, são parte das histórias de nossas vidas que podem enriquecer nosso senso de diversidade. Mas há histórias que nos levam a perpe perpetuar o colonialismo e que, que são voltadas a diminuir, a reduzir o mundo a categorias simplificadas e hierarquicamente dispostas. Um exemplo disso é Heart of Darkness, de Joseph Conrad, que é cheio de estereótipos. Ah, para evitar isso, o meu conselho é acrescentar, e é claro que é válido ler Joseph Conrad, mas é válido ler outros textos, não estou dizendo que não devemos ler. Mas vamos acrescentar e priorizar é, as mais diversas cores, um colorido, a nossa, a nossa, a nossa paisagem, de essa paisagem da nossa educação linguística e cultural. Estudem línguas. Mesmo que o foco de vocês seja no inglês, estudem espanhol também. Estudem Guarani, estudem um pouco de Yorubá, Kimbundo, ou muito. Se dediquem a essas línguas também. Estudem francês, estudem árabe, estudem maori. É, se permitam viajar através dessas línguas. E se, essas, se as asas dessa viagem forem a literatura e outras mídias produzidas por autores alinhados com a decolonialidade, então eu saberei que vocês não estão expandindo apenas vocabulário, aprendendo estruturas, aprendendo a falar, aprendendo a se comunicar. Vocês também é, vão, estarão expandindo seus horizontes. E talvez essa é a forma mais, esse é o caminho mais profícuo em direção à, à nossa liberdade. Well, I think that's it. That's what I wanted to share with you. And I'm ready for questions and comments. Thank you, Nanda. Uh, first of all, I need to acknowledge the presence of our colleagues from the Instituto de Letras. Oh. Professor Noelia, Professor Leo Marques, Professor Lucas, Professor Lucielen, Professor Savio. Also, there are several former students of ours not only former, but uh, current students. Uh, Professor Savio, uh, about the songs you showed, he said, good music. Uh, Eleo Marques is uh, asking about the language behind you. 
uh, he is he, guessing that it's Arabic. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's it's Arabic. I mean, Australia. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. That's it. Just let me say that. I've okay. said it Arabic. <laughs> Professor Noelia said that a uh, very great lesson, not only for Nobel students, but also for any student of English language. Oh, thank you. Uh, Vinicius Ribeiro said, what a fruitful discussion. And about the books you showed, he said, great recommendations. Uh, Angelo, uh, about what you mentioned, he said that it, it reminds me of the movie My Fair Lady, based on the play Pygmalion by Ber George Ber Bernard Shaw. When we think about privileged language and stigmatized language, even in the same country, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Lucas said that uh, Professor Fernanda Mota tem uma fala decolonial magnífica. Oh. Uh, Bruno Brito uh, said that accents and different varieties make a language colorful. Yes. Perfect. And uh, about what you mentioned, I'd like to just uh, add that uh, there are more than 50 English speaking countries in the world. Why are we only exposed to varieties that comes from the United States or United Kingdom, right? Why is English, why in English classes, most listening activities and in most, in most examples are from these countries? And the answer is just like you said, is imperialism and colonialism. In Brazil specifically around the beginning of the second world war, Brazil was bombarded by American music, American movies, American TV shows. Brazilian advertising uh, traditionally shows something that is not Brazil, right? Uh, those big houses, those white families, you know, having breakfast mm -hmm. with toasts and, and, and cornflakes, right? We, we don't do that. It's not Brazil. We don't see Brazil in our advertising. We don't see Brazil uh, uh, in, in the movies, right? So it's very interesting. And we, do, we don't see, we only see the United States and the United Kingdom in, in English classes, mostly, mostly. Right, and that's, and that's the problem, right? And Larissa Oliveira said that there is a TV series on Netflix from South Africa called Blood and Water. And that reminds me that now we have access to different things. Uh, uh, Netflix, for example, has lots of African TV shows and African movies, Lot, I mean, lots of them. Just put on Google, Netflix, African movies. You're gonna see a lot of them. So why do we still do that? Why do we still do, watch those American movies only? Why do we still only read those American novels? There are so many awesome writers from Africa, from the Caribbean, right? So uh, we can learn English uh, in different ways, in, in richful ways, right? Uh, uh, Angelo said that Esse pensamento decolonial é muito enfatizado na literatura de Bell Hooks. And it's interesting he said that because uh, I, there is a quote from Bell Hooks and she says exactly this, we are bombarded daily by colonizing mentality, which is what Bob Marley said, right? We mentioned that. So, uh, and Catherine Walsh, she said that modernity has invented from, was invented from a colonial violence. So, uh, and especially to the English students that are watching us, you can learn English through different videos, through different music, different movies, different TV shows, right? Don't get stuck on American things or British things. Uh, anything to add, Nanda? Yeah, and, and when you have access to this, other varieties of the language try to decolonize and deconstruct this idea that we, the way we speak to mirror uh, US or British English, uh, it's really important to, to be, I mean, to change this, this mindset and stop labeling people according to how close they sound uh, as a native speaker from these two countries. Yeah, when you should know that even in those countries, there are vari varieties. And sometimes as teachers, we don't get our students to have access to them. And this is something we could do, to get our students to, to study black English, to have access to different varieties of the language. 
and and then of course as i said that there was something that i wanted to that i said at the beginning just to you know just as food for thought um some people say i always wonder what teachers what teachers would, would have, what kind of strong teachers would have if they had a student like called marley for example and what kind of reaction this would have when if they listen to, to bob marley and the way he speaks that mirrors Jamaican English. And that reminds me, remind me, for example, of an experience I had when I was in Singapore. Um, uh, flight attendant uh, started to speak English and then some people started to laugh, saying, oh, but you know, you see the way, the way she speaks. And then, and then I could see the linguistic uh, in a very clear way for how people tend to, to think that the way some people speak would only be considered as good English if that is close to our idea of standard English, of what we learn through textbooks and through some types of media and, uh, and the way we look at the language, right? prioritizing the standard English right? uh. from a circle. Savio is also suggesting soap operas. On Netflix, there are lots of soap operas. <laughs> and yeah. there's a question for you, Nanda, a very good question from Aline Santos. She's asking, uh, partindo dessa perspectiva de decolonialidade, como isso pode, se pode, contribuir na autoestima de estudantes em escolas da periferia? Excelente pergunta. Como você fez em português, eu vou responder em português. É... Bem, essa é a minha principal bandeira. Como professora de estágio supervisionado de língua inglesa, eu sempre penso muito em como é possível ensinar inglês na escola, na escola pública, escolas de educação básica. E aí, então, foi exatamente Como na literatura se aplicam também para outras mídias, outras, é, como, por exemplo, a, a música, a, filmes. E, então, a ideia é, quando, quando, da, quando uh, as aulas forem ministradas nesses contextos, é, é importantíssimo pensar na transposição didática desses conteúdos, torná-los o mais próximo possível da realidade dos alunos. E, aí, para isso, é importantíssimo conhecer essa realidade Eu me lembro de um texto de Bell Hooks em uh, Pedagogy of Hope, em que ela fala sobre a importância de, no primeiro dia de aula, perguntar quem são os alunos, o que, é que eles gostam de fazer, o que, é que eles gostam de consumir, de ler, de, de, de assistir. E aí, então, partindo dessa, dessa pesquisa inicial, que é algo que também Paulo Freire aconselha a fazer, é, o professor pode pensar em recursos didáticos que podem ser utilizados em sala de aula. E aí, a partir disso, essa já é uma forma de decolonizar a sala de aula. Porque nós temos uma tendência a usar em sala de aula algo que segue uma linha mais top-down. A gente pega um currículo e aí, então, aplica em sala de aula. Mas, ao invés de fazer isso, então, o movimento seria bottom-up. Eu conheceria os meus alunos e, a partir disso, eu pensaria em recursos, em textos, em materiais que pudessem ser utilizados. E aí, é claro que é imprescindível fascinar os alunos, envolver os alunos é, com a literatura, apresentar, fazer uma excelente apresentação desses, desses textos, tentando motivar os alunos a, a gostar de literatura. E eu posso falar sobre uma experiência que eu tive quando eu era professora da educação básica. Eu é, dava aula a uma turma de sétima série e eu resolvi trabalhar com Pygmalion. Eu resolvi trabalhar com Pygmalion e aí usei o My Fair Lady, porque havia muito preconceito linguístico entre os alunos. Eles faziam brincadeiras, assim, às vezes, é, com, com os colegas que falavam, que produziam um certo rotacismo, né? falavam bicicleta e tal. E aí, então, eu trouxe uma discussão e pedi, e, e então, a partir dessa discussão, eu fui introduzindo é, as frases em, em inglês. Eles falavam em português, eu perguntava como é que eles diriam aquilo em inglês e colocava em inglês. Às vezes eu usava o inglês né, na aula, ao invés de falar em português. E aí, nesse processo de translinguagem. Né? 
É, e então, fiz toda uma introdução, perguntei a eles é, se eles já tinham ouvido falar no mito de Pinguim Maleão, contei a história, trouxe aqui de abelha, aquela música, hum, eu quero você como eu quero, né? que é um exemplo clássico do efeito Pinguim Maleão, quando você quer que o outro se torne aquilo que você quer, e não exatamente o que aquela pessoa quer, né? ainda bem que eu não sou assim, mas não é Lucas, mas assim, então, é, eu trouxe essa, essa música para que eles percebessem, poxa, a minha aula de inglês está perto da minha realidade. E aí, então, nós, eles aprenderam a cantar uma das músicas do, do musical, My Fair Lady, e nós discutimos sobre essa questão da possibilidade de uma, de uma ascensão através da, da, língua, da língua, da, da língua que ela aprendeu, que é o inglês, né? ela passou a aprender o inglês padrão, mas nós discutimos sobre todo o preconceito linguístico que está ali implícito, como ela passa por toda uma, todo um processo de, de domesticação para chegar àquele inglês padrão, que é o PIN. E aí, claro, isso foi, gerou uma discussão e eles é, aprenderam algumas falas do, do filme. Nós comparamos aquelas falas com trechos da peça. Eles leram, encenaram, tiveram que fazer uma encenação na sala dos trechos, tentando é, representar o que eles tinham assistido e que a gente tinha discutido. E essa foi uma forma de utilizar. E é claro que eles tiveram o um contato com a língua, porque eles aprenderam os diálogos. Houve uma discussão para causar uma conscientização sobre a noção de preconceito linguístico e também essa opressão, às vezes, da, da língua que existe da, na língua padrão e ter que falar a língua padrão. E aí, então, esse é só um exemplo de transposição didática, de como a gente pode usar a literatura para essa finalidade. E aí, quando a gente faz isso, interpretaciona essa, esse texto à realidade do aluno e o leva a pensar sobre questões como preconceito linguístico, é, imperialismo, imposição, relação, a relação entre língua e poder, a gente está colocando em prática um preceito decolonial caro, que é o de pensar... Na, na importância de deshierarquizar, na importância, a importância de descentrar o que faz parte de um centro que silencia a voz, que leva o outro a ceifar a própria subjetividade para se enquadrar numa moldura e ser aquilo que o outro quer, e que muitas vezes não dá espaço para o próprio desejo. E aí a gente pode pensar em séculos de opressão, que advém do eurocentrismo e que, então, faz parte desses pequenos atos. Quando a gente requer que o outro fale a língua padrão, quando a gente quer que o outro se comporte como a gente acha que é o modelo de comportamento. Né? Isso tudo pode ser discutido através de Gmelian, que é uma peça de um autor irlandês, e aí eu faço a minha referência a Noelia, que é uma grande estudiosa dos estudos irlandeses. É, e, então... É claro que esse é um exemplo, mas há vários outros. Tem Push, né, de Sapphire, que é um romance belíssimo. E eu, no, no livro que eu escrevi, né, o Education and Literature, infelizmente não teve lançamento aqui no Brasil. Lancei na é, University of West Indies, em Trinidad e Tobago, mas ainda vai ter, né? Vamos esperar a pandemia passar. Eu falo sobre alguns procedimentos para uso de Push, por exemplo. Porque Push apresenta uma, uma professora, Lorraine, que faz... Uh, atividades inovadoras com os alunos, atividades que é, criam uma learning community, né, uma comunidade de saberes, no sentido bem Bell Hooksiano. Então, Bell Hooks fala sobre essa comunidade de saberes. Então, ela começa a aula pedindo para que os alunos se apresentem, coloca algumas frases em inglês no, no quadro para que as alunas possam completar e falarem sobre si. E aí, então, ela faz todo um trabalho de escrita com as alunas e pede para que as alunas escrevam o que elas tiverem vivenciado. Mesmo que elas não saibam escrever, ela, então as alunas escrevem e ela escreve embaixo como seria, né? como elas poderiam expressar de um outro modo, de um modo mais, mais fácil de entender. E então elas vão desenvolvendo a escrita né? e superando alguns entraves nesse processo de aprendizagem. E aí então eu mostro um, dou um exemplo de como a gente poderia trabalhar esse trecho em sala de aula porque aí seria uma meta-aula, seria a aula de inglês em que você falaria sobre como é, aprender, como se ensina o inglês, como se aprende o inglês, como se aprende uma língua. 
Então, essa é uma das formas. Mas, assim, é, poderia ter uma outra live falando sobre educação básica. Como pensar em estratégias para a educação básica. Uh, Savio is saying that this is what we call in critical language pedagogy negotiated syllabus yeah, co-constructed exactly. with learners right? uh, about what you exactly. were talking about uh, learning say it, go ahead sorry yeah no that's the very idea of critical pedagogy the goals to shape negotiated negotiated curriculum so when it's co-constructed with the students And it's not what Paulo Freire says in Pedagogy of the Effects. He says that the first thing the teacher should do is to have uh, a notebook and take notes of the way of the way uh, of the way people speak and what kind of vocabulary they use, what is part of their routines. Instead of teaching things like, um, as we would say in Portuguese, right, when you teach the, the alphabet, uh, for example, you'd use uh, or you'd use uh, things that are part of the student's daily life. So uh, that's something that is also part of Paulo Freire's view of education. He's one of the main say, thinkers in critical pedagogy. Vinicius said that Push is one of his favorite books. I know. <laughs> About uh, learning literature, learning English through literature, a very common question that we get is uh, how to teach literature for a classroom full of, full of teenagers uh, in high schools. That is that is a tricky question, right? Uh, and you mentioned a possible answer, which is uh, working with, for example, short texts. And I'm going to show you something that you mentioned, which is uh, this is the poem uh, from Rupikau, right? So you can work with poems like these. It's a very short poem, and the topic is very interesting. I'm going to read this because it's too, it's very short, just for you to see how we can use critical pedagogy and, you know, talk about themes like uh, 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 feminism and uh, racism and all these uh, polemic, controversial topics in an English class. Uh, I want to apologize to all the women I have called pretty before I've called them intelligent or brave. I'm sorry I made it sound as though something as simple as what you're born with is the most you have to be proud of when your spirit has crushed mountains. From now on, I will say things like, you are resilient or you are extraordinary. Not because I don't think you're pretty, but because you're so much more than that. So this is a text that you could easily work in an English classroom, yeah. Renan. And I know you have lots of other examples of using literature to teenagers, something that many teachers think it's possible, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, last time I taught teaching practice too, which is when you supervise students and they teach, they teach in school. I conducted some of the classes, I taught some of the classes. Um, because there was no English teacher, the, the teacher was on a leave, and um, unfortunately, the students had didn't hadn't had any classes, and so I talked to the principals and, and, and I said I'm going to to conduct some some sessions, some English sessions. And they decided to use literature with them. They are all teenagers, and uh, I used some group course poems. And uh, one of the activities was one of the activity was uh, I got them to think about the main uh, problems we, we face when we are teenagers. So what are our main concerns and things that makes us anxious sometimes and uh, the problems we may have with our appearance and with our self-esteem. We had a discussion on that. And while we were brainstorming some ideas, I wrote some keywords on the board, words that I would know they would find in the poems. And then I, I gave them some poems for them to read in groups. And so they'd have to choose the one that would be more, uh, that would be expressive of how they feel as teenagers. And uh, it was a very interesting experience because then they, they chose the poem, they had to copy that poem on their notebooks because we know that when you give them the sheet of paper, they put away and then, then just, <laughs> that disappears. <laughs> and so I asked them to copy um, on their notebooks 
and they had to comment on that. They had to read that and they had to comment on the, on the poem. It was a very fruitful experience because then the students uh, could see that they were able to read in the language and ask them to identify, of course, the words they, they already knew and they could use the dictionary to understand some other words. I helped them with some vocabulary, but it was really nice to see them uh, trying to express their, feel, their feelings through literature. It, is, it was also a way of, uh, of having a class in which I wouldn't say what they would read. They would choose what they wanted to read and what kind of interpretation they had about that. And that should be intertwined with their, their own self, with their identity. So that was a great experience. I just want to show you one last thing Fernanda also mentioned. Uh, this is the, the catalog of uh, Netflix catalog of African movies and TV shows. Thank you so much. Many things. Mm -hmm. Lots of movies, lots of TV shows. Most of them are in English. Yes. So if you're a student, I really recommend you to watch them. Uh, I'm gonna, you can, you can just Google it. Netflix, African movies or African TV shows. Just to uh, finalize, Nand, I like us to talk very quickly about how, to students especially, right? The students who are watching us, how can they, during the pandemic, use uh, Netflix or Amazon, mo watch movies or TV shows to learn English? What can they do? What are the recommendations that we can give them to autonomously try to study English? Yeah, so there are some situations that depend on, on their level. If they're advanced learners, being exposed to, to movies, watching, even if they are not paying close attention to the subtitles, they end up learning because there is a process, learning process that we go through while we are being exposed to a language. And then we have this input. We end up having some input and that reverberates into our uh, repertoire of vocabulary. Um, so this is for advanced learners. For basic learners, I can share some of my experience with some languages, like German, for example, which is a challenge for me. Something happened with Nanda? Well, something happened with her audio. I think she's going to come back eventually. But why she's not coming back, I, I'd like to, well, she, she, she's out. Uh, I'd like to uh, give suggestions. For example, if you want to learn English through movies or TV shows, uh, you can choose the subtitle. Depending on your level, I would uh, recommend you to put subtitles in English, right? So you can read. And don't be afraid to use the remote control. You can go back, pause. Try to uh, use that opportunity, not only to watch the movie, but to pay attention to the language. Now that you're back, right? Okay, I'm back, sorry. I was, I was, telling, so, them, I was, telling, I was suggesting them to uh, use the subtitles options, depending on their English level, to put it uh, English subtitles or put Portuguese subtitles, depending on their level, and try to focus not only on the movie, but on the language, the linguistic aspects as well. Pause. Uh, going back, you know, try to pay attention to that as well. Oh, she's frozen again. Anyway. Yeah. And before watching the movie, another good suggestion is trying to uh, watch the trailer, try to uh, be aware of what the movie is about. Watch uh, interviews with the actors, right? Uh, that's a pre-watching. And then you watch the movie with more, you know, repertoire of what's going on, of what's, what you're going to watch. And uh, pay attention to pronunciation, pay attention to intonation, pay attention to stress. Try to repeat something. When you listen to something interesting that the actor or the character says, try to repeat it. Pause. Uh, watch it with a dictionary, with an online dictionary. And it's very interesting because you can... Uh, you can have access to different cultures. You can have access to different varieties of English. 
And now, Nanda, you're back? Yeah, I think I am. <laughs> okay, so Sorry. Uh, let's wrap it up. It's, uh, it's already. Uh... Yeah, no, something that I did with German was I used to watch an episode without subtitles. Then I would uh, watch it again. So it would take like 20 minutes. Then I would watch it again with subtitles. And I tried to notice the words, the vocabulary. I tried to, to learn. So it took notes. Okay. Then I watch it again so that I could check whether the words I had I had, I had taken taken notes of uh, I could recall, right, and learn. So that I, that was a way of consolidating what I was studying. So that's something that it's something that can work for uh, students who are on a basic level, right, a basic level of English. So try to watch with subtitles, then without subtitles, uh, and try to notice. No, because when you are, you are an advanced learner, you can uh, easily get some some input, even when you don't focus on, on what you're watching. But when you are on a basic level, it's important to try to notice. So you, you listen to someone saying, don't worry. So, okay, don't worry. Let me take notes here. Let me notice how that is pronounced. And then let me try to see when and how I could use that. So. That's a way of turning input into intake, right? Something that is going to be part of, of your uh, repertoire of, of sentences or words. So uh, we can learn English through literature, through movies, yeah. music. Yes. And during the pandemic, we don't have classes, but you can do that autonomously. Yes. And the you math. Have a lot of Go ahead, sorry. And you can have a lot of fun doing that. Yes. Listening to Calypso songs and watching TV shows and reading literature, reading poetry. And uh, we recommend you to focus not only in American and British varieties, but in other varieties as well. I'm not saying you, you cannot watch American movies. Uh, I watch them, we all watch them, but not only them. There are lots of good things around, right? Available to us. So let's uh, let's try to see what the what the English from the other fifty countries that speak English as an official language is like. Yeah. Right. And let's try to have an understanding that uh, English is not spoken in monolingual contexts. There are other languages being spoken to. Right. Sometimes so it's important to have this. Um, of this multilingual country, English is spoken, especially yes. in Mexican countries. Yes. Uh, thank you, Nanda. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. You. Thank you very much. We planned this live for 40, 50 minutes. It's like two hours already. Oh, really? Yes. Thank you for the participation. Uh, I'm Daniel. I'm professor. I'm, I'm a professor at Instituto de Letras as well. Fernanda is my colleague, and we had a, I had an, a wonderful time. I hope you had a wonderful time as well. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Nanda, again. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.